<coughs> check, check. Um, but he's he's a really good coach, so. I don't know who they play today. Who is it? Florida? I think. Auburn? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Three people. <clears throat> yeah. And he didn't, like, he didn't, he just like, ah, well, he didn't seem too upset about it. Like the rest no, of the... You say your nose was running? Oh, yeah. And you said you better go catch it? Yep. <laughs> That's the way to start off the day, right? Nice little pun like that. Is that a pun? I don't know. Dad joke? Yeah, I could see that. I think he claims to be. There was something up, because it's been probably three years since I've seen anything. There was something about him that just didn't, that wasn't the same. That was it. Yeah. So I see that uh, Ronnie and Judith, RL. Bruce White's watching. Bruce. Bruce. Bruce King. Now that's. Um, <clears throat> That's the same thing. There's this guy that uh, from Arizona. Um, he claims to teach right division, dispensationalism. Um, he claims that he's King James only, but he's always Greek this, Greek that. It should be translated this, and then he uses other other versions too. So. Um, but he was billed last month as the first dispensationalist in Lexington to have a conference. Because some group in Lexington had him come out from, is it Arizona or New Mexico? I think it's Arizona. Um, but he preaches at a Baptist church. Um, but he claims that he's an Acts 9 dispensationalist. But there's something just... Like I've I've listened to some of his things, and there's a lot of people that are jumping on him, like liking him. And there's just something I don't know, something about him just doesn't seem right. But I'm looking into it. <clears throat> Well, there's there's dispensationalists. There's Acts nine dispensationalists that do baptize, not just that they're in a Baptist church, but they actually baptize. Um, for whatever reason, but um, <clears throat> so I don't know. Yeah, I'm still looking into him. There's a lot of people that seem to, to like him. But, I don't know. <clears throat> All right. Romans 16. One thing. Bluegrass Bible Conference, June 21st, 22nd, 23rd. That's coming up really before we know it. I mean, you think, what, two weeks? Two weeks from today is April. Right? We're in April. 
That's just wild to think about. Um, and then you got May and June, and then it's here. So <clears throat> we'll see what happens. Um, so I don't know. I asked. I've asked Charlie McQuillan if he'd come. Um, they just had their fourth or fifth baby this past week, I think. Him and his wife. Um, so I don't know if he'll be able to or not, but <clears throat> but we'll see what happens. So, all right. <clears throat> Romans 16. I want to thank you all for being here today, folks online. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're getting closer to the end of Romans 16. Um, the problem is, is we probably won't get far <laughs> today in, in Romans 16 just because we're going to go to some other things. But this, this idea uh, that I want to make sure that we get <clears throat> um, uh, before, we, before we move on uh, to get the rest of this. But notice, <clears throat> I'm going to start reading in verse 17 and uh, I'll read down through verse 20. <clears throat> And uh, we'll see how far we get today. So Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses con contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men, I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. May we open our hearts and minds to what your word says. Allow your word to be the final authority in all things. Not thoughts, opinions about stuff, but your word, uh, what it says, allow it to be the final authority uh, in, in, in every uh, thought, precept, and, and manner of life in which we live. That we might be able to live life glorifying unto you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So, verse, verse 17. Um, <clears throat> and I've, I've mentioned this a couple, tif a couple different times. Um, Paul, Paul says here in verse 17, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So there's two times that Paul makes mention of the word mark, to mark people. One, it's a good thing um, because they're in samples. The other one, it's a bad thing, um, and he tells them to avoid all right so then what it comes down to is he says mark them as people you should do uh, and then mark them you should um, avoid and this idea of marking is um, actually what, he, what he's dealing with here is really calling them out by name um, which Paul does quite a bit, um, <clears throat> which we could take a look at that uh, real quick. <clears throat> um, like I said, there's two times that Paul says, mark them. Uh, one of them's here, and you notice he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to what? To the doctrine. All right? Is it just any doctrine? which you have learned, right? Notice, so there's doctrine that you've learned, and he says, mark them that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. There's doctrine that you've learned, and, and, and the thing about this is, you know, we've talked about this before. In the book of Romans, Romans, we know, is the foundational book, right? It's the foundational book um, it's a doctrine book, and what pa what Paul does through uh, the book of Romans is lays out for us really the plan of salvation. Talks to us about the fact that here's how you know that you're saved. Here's how you know you're justified. Here's how you know that you're made righteous. Here's how you know all this stuff. 
Um, here's how you know that you're dead to sin. Here's how you know that you're dead to the law. Here's how you know that you're dead to the flesh. And here's how you know how to live, right? And then he goes in 9, 10, and 11 and says, here's why things are different now because of the dispensational change prior to everything that came before it. And then in 12 through 16, he says, okay, here's how you take all the doctrine that I've given you and here's how you live it in your life, right? And that's exactly what he's talking about here. Um, but notice, I want, I want you to see um, the idea of marking them is not just saying to yourself, I'm, gonna not, I'm not going to pay attention to this guy or whatever it is. Um, he's actually talking about calling out by name. Now, the thing that I do want to mention real quick, um, this is a personal choice that we make on our own. Right, and I've said this before. We were talking about a guy before, and I was telling the folks over in Moorhead Friday night, I'm not going to say don't go listen to this person, but you might want to be mindful of some of the things that they teach and just keep that in mind as you go along. So what happens is if you've learned doctrine, then what do you have to compare what they teach to is what? The doctrine. Now, one of the things that he's really dealing with here is he's talking about the local assembly. So one day, you know, when we get eight people in here, big time in it, um, when we, and somebody decides, hey, I want to teach one day, and I'll let them teach. And they stand up here and they teach that, you know, baptism is for us today. Well, then in the local assembly, what we would do is talk to that person, show them through Scripture that, this, that baptism's not for today, and then they have a choice. Do they believe the verses, or do they believe what they already believe? Okay, And so then what happens is, if they say, well, I'm just going to stick with what I believe, I don't care what the verses say, then what we do is mark them, and then they're gone. That's what he's talking about here in the local assembly is what he's dealing with. Now, the tough part is, when you take this, and you do it on a broader scale. Okay? Um, but the issue is always how you go about doing this. It's not just you hear somebody teach something, you're like, that person's wrong, kick them out. I'm going to mark them and avoid them. But what you do is you go talk to them. And so this is where issues that we've seen in Facebook, no one does that. They just mark and avoid, and they just start yelling out names, and guess who unfriended me, and all this junk, and they're proud of themselves. There's a, there's a process in which Paul lays out for us, and we'll see this. There's a process that Paul lays out, and what he's dealing with specifically, of course, he's talked about the first um, 16 verses of this chapter. He's talked about what? All these local assemblies. right? People meeting in houses, people meeting in churches, and he's talking about the local assembly, but course there is a broader scale to this so <clears throat> go real quick uh first timothy chapter one <clears throat> and a couple of these guys we'll see over and over again which uh should kind of tell you definitely make make sure you know about these guys <clears throat> um notice in first timothy chapter one uh starting verse 18 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Notice, of whom Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So then, when we think about what's going on here, what's he tell Timothy? Here's how you here's how you war good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have done what, made shipwreck. Okay, and then one of those things we might automatically go to over in Ephesians, where Paul talks about be not be no more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. All right. So if you're out in the ship, what happens if you get in rough winds? You start doing this, moving back and forth, and then what takes place is eventually you shipwreck. You capsize, and it's a shipwreck. And so the, the terminology that Paul uses through here, 
He's, he's saying, you all know, Timothy, you know the doctrine, you've learned the doctrine, and you know something that you can compare these people no, to. Notice he says, verse 20, of whom Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, um, <clears throat> I don't know if Hymenaeus and Alexander are actually saved people. Um, it's a good possibility that they were, but then they've erred in the truth. And so then what Paul's done is he's done exactly what we're talking about. He's gone to them, showed them verses, and says, here's, here's what we actually need to know about the faith and holding that in a good conscience. And so then what they said, I could imagine what they would say is, well, we're going to go and teach what we're going to teach, no matter what you say. Now, it, it could they could have been saved. In fact, I would almost say that they were members of the Church of the Body of Christ, but they've fallen into false doctrines. And what does Paul do? He says, I've delivered them unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. So what's that mean? Well, if they're out here teaching false doctrine, who is it that's really behind the false doctrine? Satan. And you know, you know, you go over to 2 Thessalonians and, and Paul talks about the fact that one day during the tribulation period, people are going to believe what they believe and God's going to send them strong delusions that they would believe a lie. And what it is, is God saying, I'm going to give you up to what you already want anyway. Do you know why? Because you have a free will. If Calvinism was true, then he couldn't say that. Right? So it's one of those things. We, we saw it when we were going through, what, Romans 9, 10, and 11, when we went back and we saw how, um, the, how, how God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Well, how did he harden the heart of Pharaoh? Pharaoh said, this is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. I don't care what signs, what, what you do to any of my family, any of my friends, whatever it may be. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And so what God did says, because that's what you want in your will, I'm going to allow you to do that. And so what Paul does is says what? I'm going to turn you over to your false doctrine. I'm going to let you go and you go live in it. But do you know what he does? He marks them calls them out by name and avoids them. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> right, right then, 1 Timothy 1.20. <coughs> so 2 Timothy chapter 1, um, verse 1. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 1. I said verse 1, didn't I? Um, drop down to verse 13. And we see the same thing. He's talking to Timothy again, right? And we see the same thing. Notice in verse 13. Hold fast the form of what? Sound words. You know what those sound words are? Doctrine. Right? That's what he's dealing with. And you'll see that <clears throat> as we go down. Which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, that that good thing was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Notice. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, notice, of whom uh, Phygelus and Hermogenes, the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. So he names two people, Phygelus and Hermogenes. Right? He says, thou, This thou knowest, with, uh, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. And then he mentions two people by name. So then again, does it sound like Phygelus and Hermogenes were probably just saved individuals who just got caught up in false doctrine? And they're teaching false doctrine. Um, I, think it, I think it's possible that's what he's dealing with. You know, when, when Paul talks about the fact that in the last days, what's going to take place is people are going to turn away from the truth. Right? The doctrine that they know, they're going to turn their back on that doctrine. And he, was, he saw that during his time. Now, I don't know um, if Phygelus and Hermogenes or Alexander and Hymenaeus were, were saved or not, but it's a good possibility that they were. Um, go to chapter 2. <clears throat> so, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um, the... Uh, I was going to mention a book, but I just lost the title of it. I'll think of it here in a little bit. There's a book that's going through, uh, really, 2 Timothy. He talks about, um, here's, 
here's some false doctrines that was taking place back then, and we see the same thing going on today. Um, and there's, there's, there's one issue that I want to mention, and I think Romans, if we actually understand the doctrine, a lot of that stuff goes away, right? Um, but notice this, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 16, right? So everybody knows verse 15. Verse 16, he says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. So again, you see this guy Hymenaeus again. <laughs> Let's strike two on him. You, know, you think about that. He didn't learn the first time. Paul says, I've turned him over, over to Satan. Well, the very next book that he writes to, to Timothy, he's talking about this guy again, saying... Not only was he doing this stuff, but now he's teaching this. Um, but notice, he says, Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. So when we, when we take a look at that one, um, what is it that they really have a problem with there? Is It's not just bad doctrine, but it's the timing of the doctrine. right? So they're saying that the, the resurrection is already taking place when it's not. Um, so, chapter 4. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 4. Uh, start, in verse, uh, start in verse 11. <clears throat> well, start in verse 10. There, there's another guy here in verse 10. Notice, <clears throat> notice what he says. Verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Uh, Cretans in Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is uh, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus, uh, Tychicus have I sent to uh, Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee in the books, but especially the parchments. Notice. Alexander the coppersmith did much evil. The Lord reward him according to, um, to his works, of whom be thou uh, ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but, uh, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. So, I mean, you think there, Paul is saying, here's some people that came against me, and they were, they were, they were withstanding our words, and he says, my, my prayer is that God doesn't hold it against them. You know, that, that's, that's a real grown-up thing to say. Um, but, if, but if you look there, <clears throat> notice in verse 15 where he says, Of whom be thou where also? All right. <clears throat> so I don't know if this does this for you all, um, but that word where, the W-A-R-E, that reminds me of something in the book of Galatians. So go to Galatians real quick. <clears throat> He's saying there's doctrine that you all have learned and you can look at someone's ministry. And lay it next down, lay it down next to the Bible, specifically the doctrine um, that you've been taught. And you can lay their ministry next to that and say, okay, does what they teach match up with what it says? What they teach. Now, a lot of people, it's really easy, right? Um, I mean, you could you could take, you know, people like Kenneth Copeland and, and Joel Osteen and all those guys. You put their ministry up to the Bible, and it's not even close, right? But then what happens is, what if you get somebody? that actually understands the Bible rightly divided and teaches the Bible rightly divided, but then they start teaching something wrong, then, you know, then where you left off. And so that where, be aware, be aware of their ministry. Pay attention to what they're doing, uh, which is why I say all the time, check me out. I'm, I'm going to be wrong on stuff, and I'm okay with that. Um, but I want people to call me on it. Because the best thing to do is um, come to me, say, hey, I don't know if you taught this verse right or this passage right. Let me know. And then we can sit down with an open Bible and figure it out. And if I won't change my mind, 
then you can call me out, and then we can go from there, right? Um, but notice here, uh, Galatians chapter 2, um, verse 4. <clears throat> And, I, and I've, mentioned, I've mentioned this verse before, and it's one of those things, when I see that uh, beware also, um, what he was talking about over in 2 Timothy, it makes me think of this Galatians chapter 2, verse 4. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us un, into bondage. So you've got somebody over here teaching false doctrine, And you have somebody unaware that they're teaching false doctrine and they say, hey, we should have this guy come preach. All right, and that's what, that's what, are, that's what, he, that's what they're doing here. He says, and that because of false brethren, unaware is brought in. So these people are unaware of what they teach and they're saying, hey, what about this guy? Let's pay attention to this guy. Um, and so then that's what makes me that's what makes me think of that because he uses that word where back over in Second Timothy. So, you know, we're talking about the guy uh, from New Mexico or Arizona, wherever he's from, I can't remember. Um, I can't get a read on anything really what he does, so that's one reason why I'm kind of leery of him. And I've reached out and there's no response. So that even broadens my my weariness of of thinking about you know maybe this guy's is, is good or not and the bad thing is is there's a group of people in lexington who follow that guy who know that we're here who knows we teach mid acts dispensationalism and they went to his church in arizona or new mexico rather than coming here they just I don't know, something, uh, again, I don't know, the guy won't respond, so um, so there's no real way to have a conversation with him. Now, there is some other people that I've contacted on certain things, and they have gotten back to me, and uh, they're really, Brother Jordan would call them mugwomps. Um, and when he says mugwomp, he's talking about somebody that's got their mug on one side of the fence and their womp on the other side. And they're just straddling the fence, and they don't really want to tip the cart and let people know what they actually teach. Um, so I've got a guy that I've contacted about some of the stuff that he teaches, and his responses are almost as cryptic as um, an Egyptian hieroglyphics. They're mugwampish. And so that's why when, for me, um, me personally, and again, and again, this is me personally, <coughs> I don't know of anything that, and I could be wrong, but I don't know of anything that if somebody asked me where I stood on it, I won't. T I would tell you straight out, and I'd have the verses for it, All right? So you know, we're talking about how is it that you do this when you come across this? You don't just call people out, but you go to them. You say, okay, hey, let's go talk about some doctrine. All right. Let's go take a look at the Bible, pull out, pull out the Bible, let's talk about the Bible, and if you choose to stick with what you believe rather than what the Bible is, then you can go call them out. But all too often we're quick to call out names, which is why I've not said the, the guys' names that I'm talking about there, because um, I'm still trying to have conversations with them. So, for instance, you know, we talked about um, the big thing over the past year has been everybody's forgiven. All right, so everybody goes and they go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and then they misread 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and says, well, everybody's forgiven. Well, <clears throat> the verse that fixes that is in the book of, doc the book of doctrine in, in Romans chapter 3. It says it's unto all. I mean, everybody has access to it, but it's upon all them that believe. The verse takes care of it. The doctrine takes care of their false un understanding of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So the book of doctrine takes care of that. So we've talked about it before. God's given the scriptures. Why? For doctrine, for proof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So then, is it any wonder why we have First and Second Corinthians, books that 
correct bad behavior. And Galatians that follows that, which is how to correct bad doctrine. And every time, and we've talked about this before, haven't we studied 1st, 2nd Corinthians and Galatians as we've gone through the book of Romans? Alright? So then, how do, you, how do you deal with people's understandings with these books is you go back to the doctrine that establishes it all, and then you just allow that to be the issue, and then they can choose to follow it or not. Now, <clears throat> there's some other things that I'm going to get to with different types of um, issues that we're going to come across. One, you know, doctrinally, one... Um, the way people act. <clears throat> how how all this stuff works. So first, what I want to do, let's go back to uh, let's go back to Daniel. There's a, uh, you know, I was, I was talking to Delilah uh, last week, Daniel chapter one. I was talking I was talking to Delilah, and I said, you know, I got to thinking. We'd mention after this, we'll do some, you know, topical studies, you know, things like that, and uh, see if we can get the four watches finally recorded properly and a couple of other things that we've had problems with. I can't even remember all of them we've had trouble with, but trees. I thought we got that one. I thought that one actually did. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe not. Huh? There might have been. I can't remember what it is, but there was that there was the four watches. Uh it might have been the four trees and there's something else maybe that we did that never did never did work as far as the audio or whatever, but uh so things like that that I wanna do. Um and then I told Delilah, I said, So we're talking about let's let's start in Matthew. But then I said in order to really get Matthew, what we need to do is go back and study Daniel. And she said, I don't know, Daniel's pretty heavy. And then she's like, wait, it's all heavy. I was like, it's true. I mean, you think about that. Because, you know, when we get to, when we get to the book of Matthew, the very first thing we find out in the book of Matthew is what? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, what kingdom? It's the kingdom that was talked about back in Daniel. So, I mean, we could, but um, so I was thinking, you know, we could go back to Daniel and do do Daniel a little bit. That way, we get an idea of the the kingdom that's that's being proposed um, and saying it's being offered out there, and then saying it's it's at hand. Um, so we'll see we'll see what happens. But what made me think of that is, you know, hey, we're here anyway. So uh, Daniel chapter one. <clears throat> so what I what I want to talk about today is. Um, there's a doctrine of separation. Oh, man. All right, there's a doctrine of separation that God clearly lays out uh, for us. And so most people want to talk about, well, we need to separate, we need to separate. And then it's easy to talk about, well, I'm going to separate myself from Joel Osteen, right? I'm going to separate myself and our, what we're doing with um, Kenneth Copeland or um, John Hagee or whatever it is. The, the, here's the big problem. Um, when, when we mention we're dispensationalists, automatically we're lumped in with people like John Hagee. Because John Hagee is a dispensationalist. The only problem is he's an Acts 2 dispensationalist. Right? <clears throat> and so uh, the guy that I was talking about um, out in New Mexico or Arizona for some reason, I can't remember which one it is. <clears throat> um, he's got seven dispensations, which is kind of the normal thought process of dispensationalists, rather than time past, but now and ages to come. Um, they put terms on them what they come up with. Um, the dispensation of innocence, for instance, that's before Genesis three, that there is a time period, and then they set up all these rules for what makes the dispensation. And you're like, none of this stuff's in Scripture. Um, and it's easy just to go to the verses and it says, time passed, but now he's just come. You find out what was the thing that was going on in time past. There was a difference, but now there's not. You know, The Scripture allows you to say, here's what it is. And, and another one Paul does is you can get two dispensations. So 
uh, then you get the idea of are you a, a subtra dispensationalist or a super dispensationalist so do you not divide it enough or do you divide it too much you know there's there's all this stuff out there and as soon as you say you know we're dispensationalists everybody's like they throw their hands up and be like ah it's not a real word you're like well go read your bible get your king james it's in there don't worry about it um so it's easy it's easy to separate ourselves from from certain things um, but there's something there's no one really ever talks about how all right everybody says well we should separate from this this and this and they'll talk about um you know the old the old saying um i don't drink smoke or chew and i don't hang with the folks that do that kind of thing you know churches forever they were like can't go dancing I mean, they made a whole movie about that one, right? Good movie, okay. Well, I don't know if I'd say a good movie, but... Um, yeah, that's right. Um, and then then you've got uh, certain people say, well, it's a sin to go to the movies. And if you go to the movies, then you're not allowed in the assembly and all this stuff. If, if, you, don't, if you don't wear a, a skirt, you're, you're not in the church. If your beehive's not tall enough, then you're kicked out. You know, whatever it is, and they've, yeah, that's that's a thing. Really? The higher the hair, the closer to God, right? That's what they say. That's really a thing. That's really a thing. But I mean, you know, when we make light of that stuff, because why why do we make light of that stuff? Is because it's ignorant stuff based on misinterpretation of everything, and so then people set up things like. Well, if you do this or this or this or this, then you're no longer allowed in the assembly. What is it that Paul said the basis of it is, is what? The doctrine. Do you know how clear cut that is? Well, you can smoke once a week, but not twice a week. If you do twice a week, we'll kick you out. Don't do it on Sunday. Don't do it on Sunday. You know, I, I was thinking about that. Um, and I'd mentioned this before when we were in Chicago, and I can't remember if I'd said it here. Uh, I'd mentioned this in Chicago. We had our old church on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, after church, we go to a gas station. Uh, it's actually the one that Delilah's aunt ran. And uh, so I go in there, and I, I'm like, I want to I want to get some gas and have a little gas can. And she said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going to mow my yard. She's like, you can't work on Sunday. I was like, you just sold me gas. You're literally working and telling me and telling me not to work on Sunday. I just, you know, things like that just kind of doesn't make sense. But that's what that system, that's what that, that theological system out there that follows the course of this world, that's what it does. And, and so we see that back here in the book of Daniel. And so what God does with Daniel is he sets up, here's how this is going to take place. So <clears throat> go back to... Um, Daniel chapter 1, um, we'll take a look, uh, I'm going to start reading in, start off in verse, uh, start off in verse, uh, verse 1. So Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So I want you to think about really what's going on right here is this guy comes in and he takes over this place and he takes all the things <clears throat> that would belong to the house of God, all the vessels, and what's he do? He goes and puts them in his God's uh, for better, lack of a better word, temple, right? The house of his God. So what is it that he's actually doing is what? <clears throat> the, 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 issue, the issue that Israel dealt with all the time back there was spiritual fornication. All right? So what they were doing is they were following other gods, and, you know, how many gods are supposed to be before God? The answer is zero, right? He says there are no, God, there are no other gods. And so then that's one of those things we first start seeing 
really what's going on here is, is this issue with the, for lack of better terms, the religious relics, if you think of it that way. The things, the vessels that were in the house of God, this guy took and he put them in the house of his God. And you see that he says that over and over again. But notice in verse 3, <clears throat> And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his, of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might, notice, teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. All right, so we see that language, what they're doing is they're teaching them the learning and the language of the Chaldeans. And so what they're trying to do is take these, these, these young people out of Israel and bring them into and, and uh, assimilate them to their culture. All right, <clears throat> verse 5, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So we see here we've got these four young men uh, that, he, that he's pointing out and talking to us about. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And what does the king do? He appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. All right. Verse 7, Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and, uh, and to Azariah the, uh, of Abednego. So what do they do? They change their four names to completely different names. <clears throat> now, um, Belshazzar, that's call, that, that means the prince of Baal. Right, so the whole issue back here was Baal worship, right? There was this doctrinal issue that they had with what's going on back here. Um, uh, Shadrach means uh, commanded by Rack. Rack is one of the names of the sun gods of the Babylonians and the Egyptians. You've got to think, at this time, they're in what? Babylonian captivity at this particular time. Um, then you have uh, Mishael, uh, his name... Uh, really means uh, who is like God, uh, and that's changed to Meshach. And so what they do is they give him the name, which means um, who is like Shaq. Shaq is another one of their uh, is 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 another one of the gods of of Egypt that they use to describe. Um, guess who? The queen of Eden, of, of heaven. Um, do y'all know anybody that? Um, has the title of Queen of Heaven today? Mary. Mary. You know, you think about you think about all this stuff that we see out in the religious religious world. Every bit of that stuff came from Baal worship. Every bit of it. The relics that they have in um, you name what religion. There was a kid that came up to me um, Friday as I was leaving. He came up to me Friday and said, "Would you partake in a, a poll?" that I'm doing. I said, sure. He said, um, what I want you to do is um, put your initials and then uh, tell me what religion you are and tell me why. And it's just something he's wanting to do and I don't know what he's going to do with it, but I'm kind of curious now. Um, and you know, I got to thinking, if I put down Christian, I was like, not really a religion anyway, so if I put down Christian, what is that kid going to think about Christian? Well, you know, one of the things people talk about today is um, Catholics, Christians, they're the same. And they're not. You know, we talk about... Um, and the way you see this stuff today, there is no separation. You've got Baptist churches here in our town who are observing Lent. So they're bringing in Catholic traditions into their churches who at one time were Protestants which came from people who gave their lives to get people out of that junk 
and yet they're going back to it. And there's no separation there. So then when we look at somebody, I was mentioning that on Friday night in, in Moorhead, and, and they said, well, um, the reason people do that is because they want to get closer to God. And I said, I understand that. But let me ask you a question. If you're in Christ and Christ is in you, how much closer can you get? So then we talked about fasting. Is there a reason to fast? Paul fasted. Why did he fast? It was for a health reason. Not because it was to get closer to God. So then we talk about that. <clears throat> and, and, and what this religious system does is if, if Satan can get you to add some ceremony, Lent, baptism, um, tithing, whatever it is, if Satan can get you to add anything, any ceremony that allows you to say, I've done something, then you're just like the rest of that religious system. Instead of just standing on the verse that says, I'm completing Christ, there's nothing I need to add to it. There's nothing, in fact, that I can add to it. Instead of just standing on who we are in Christ and allowing that to automatically separate us from other people to begin with. All right? But notice, as we keep on going, verse 8. But Daniel, notice, what did he do? Purposed in his heart. He made a choice of his own free will that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall... Uh, ye make me endanger my head to the king. So what's he saying? <clears throat> He's saying, I think you need to eat this stuff because if you don't, then you're going to be sickly and you're going to look different than everybody else. And I don't want you to do that. And besides that, if that if it comes out that I'm not making you eat this food or drink this, then I'm the one that's going to get killed for it. Right? And that's what he's dealing with here. Notice, <clears throat> Verse 11, Then said Daniel to Melzar, who, uh, whom the prince of the eunuchs had, had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. By the way, <clears throat> you notice the scriptures right there didn't use their Chaldean names. Uh, Prove thy servants. I beseech thee, notice, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Let then let our countenances be looked upon at before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. Now what he's saying is, you let those guys eat what you're going to offer them for ten days. We're going to eat what? <clears throat> Pulse and drink water. And he says, after the ten days, I want you to look at the two groups, us and everybody else, and see which one looks healthier. Really what's going on here is what? <clears throat> um, that spiritual fornication, you've got this God that this person set up above the God of, of Israel. And so where do you th what do you think that they did with the meat and the drink before they gave it to the people? Offered it to their God. So then what Daniel is saying, I, he purposed in his heart that he's not going to take that and commit that spiritual fornication. Now it's not talking about you shouldn't go eat steak or you shouldn't drink wine. That's not what he's talking about. The issue there is it was offered up to idols. So then that begs the question, are we able to eat things today that are offered up to idols? We just read over in Romans 14 that we could, right? In fact, the strong brother says, I can eat anything as long as I receive it with thanksgiving. All right? Notice, <clears throat> verse 14. 
So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at, at the end of the ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat of the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and wine that they should drink and give and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. What was the reward from God to them separating themselves from the rest of that, those, those young men or what? He gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Paul tells us what? <clears throat> what he wants us to know is what? What's he, what he wants us to pray for is what? Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. You know, we go over to 1 first, first Corinthians 3, and he lays out, Gold, silver, and precious stones. We've already looked at this before. You go back to Proverbs, you find out gold, silver, and precious stones equal, uh, equal up to what? Wisdom, knowledge, and spiritual understanding. Not in that particular order, but that's what he's dealing with. So then, what we get automatically up front was something that Daniel uh, received. But notice, he says in verse 18, Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the, and the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Again, use their, their real names. Notice, therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding the king inquired of them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued uh, even under the first year of King Cyrus. So you think about, you think about what's going on there. The whole, the whole doctrine of separation there is what? He purposed in his heart that he was not going to do what? Huh? Okay, he wasn't going to partake of what they were offering, right? So then when we think about this, this separation, <clears throat> there's, there's some issues here um, that, uh, that we want to make sure that we, that we see, right? <clears throat> um, go real quick to uh, Exodus chapter 13, uh, 30, 34, Exodus 34. You know, when you think about when Christ goes in and he starts kicking over the tables in the temple, what was he doing? He's saying, Israel, you've not separated yourself from this religious system and you're out here doing the exact same thing that your fathers did, just committing spiritual fornication. You're just going about doing religious things because you think that's what you're supposed to be doing. Um, <clears throat> Exodus 34 um, <clears throat> start in verse 10 <clears throat> so this is this is after so I want you to think about where we are in Exodus 34 prior to this God gives Moses the Ten Commandments right on two tables of stone Moses starts to walk down the hill. What's he see? Everybody dancing around this golden calf because they've taken all the gold that they had, melted it down, made a calf. And they're, they're thinking, man, where we just came from was a whole lot better than where we are right now. And so what's he do? He throws down the two tablets of stone. Chapter 34, it's the second giving of that. All right? So you see in verse 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. All right, so that's where we are. Verse 10. <clears throat> and he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels, such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, in all the people among which thou art shall see the which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing 
that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. Now that kind of makes us think of uh, 2 Timothy where he talks about um, a person recovering themselves out of the snare of the devil. So they come into false doctrine, they, they, they learn some false doctrine, they start teaching a false doctrine. And so then what happens is Paul comes along and says, hey, you don't need to be teaching that, you need to teach this. And what that person does is by their own free will, they in their own heart decide, I'm going to believe the verses rather than what I believed. And they are able to rescue themselves out of the snare of the devil. And so he's saying the same thing here to them. Don't let these other people be, in, be, a, be a snare uh, in the midst of these. Verse 13. Notice what he says to do. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. The, uh, thou shalt make thee no molten images." So when we think, or molten gods, so when we think about what's going on here, what was Daniel doing was he was following Exodus 34. When he's going into this other land, he, he didn't go into covenant with them. He didn't, he didn't eat anything that was sacrificed to their gods. He didn't drink anything sacrificed to their gods. He didn't go and commit spiritual fornication. And that's what he was doing. What was he doing? He just believed God's Word. And he was, he was living his life based upon what the words on the page actually said. <clears throat> um, go real quick to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> You know, there's there's people out there um, right now, and I've been I've been shocked to see how many uh, videos I see that are anti-dispensationalist. Um, the problem is, again, they're lumping people together that don't need to be lumped together. But um, what that tells me is people's paying attention. <laughs> And there's probably more of us out there than, than we actually think about. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice, notice in verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. Um, this, is, this is on the hills. Paul's talking about, um, in verse 8 says, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and, three and twenty thousand. The... The, the fornication he's talking about here is idolatry and what they were going through at that time. Notice in verse, verse, uh, verse 14. He says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as the wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifice partakers of the altar. What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not, that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the tables of devils, table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Notice what he says. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. When we think about what he's talking about here, he's saying, don't partake in this stuff. Why? Is he saying, here's a rule that you need to live by, don't partake in this. 
No, he says, it's lawful for you to go do it, but it's not expedient. It's lawful for you to do it, but it doesn't edify. So then we look at those things. Um, is that different than what, what, what Daniel had back there? Daniel was going by Exodus 34 and says, don't partake in anything like that. And it's a different thing. So could you, could you go back and teach people based on Daniel 1 that they don't eat any food offered to, offered to other gods? You could. But what you miss out on is this verse over here if you don't actually allow it to, to, to take care of it where it is um, in the Scriptures. <clears throat> Let's see. Man, it's... Eleven thirty-three. All right, <clears throat> um, go back to Daniel, real quick. Hmm. Are you at chapter one? Yes. That's pretty good. So what we see here is Daniel sets up a standard for the separation. And as I said before, we talk about, people talk about separation, but they never talk about how. And again, like I've said, I'm never going to tell you all, don't go listen to somebody, that's up to you. All right. Um, but if you do, check them out, talk to them, see what they can come up with and go from there. But he sets up, he sets up in, in Daniel chapter 8, or chapter 1, Verse 8, he sets up um, the standard for this separation. In chapter 1, verse 8, <clears throat> But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So, first thing we see is what? It's a heart issue. And then that heart issue says, I'm going to choose not to defile myself. I'm going to ask you a question. <clears throat> Who are you? Who are you? Huh? All right, so that's the issue, right? So God's already declared us. We don't have to die and then perform three posthumous miracles to be called a saint. God calls us saints. <clears throat> you go read in 1st and 2nd Corinthians and he calls them saints and then you read 1st and 2nd Corinthians you're like, these people are saints? I mean, the guy had an affair with his dad's mom. But he calls him a saint. Because who we are in Christ isn't based upon what we do, what we say, how we live. It's based on who He's made us in Christ. So when He says, here He says, He chooses in His heart, He purposed in His heart that He would not defile Himself. And so then what we need to know and understand is who are we? In Christ. So then what that does is sets up the stage for a whole bunch of other things. Go get uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second <clears throat> Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> um And we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at a bunch of these different things, but I want you to see three verses, and then we'll finish up today. This is, this is the first one. <clears throat> first Corinthians chapter six, or Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 14, has been used for time and memoriam on a saved person can't be married to an unsaved person. 
And they say, if you're saved and you're dating a person that's unsaved, you can't be married. If you want to think that way, that's fine. But that's not what that verse is talking about. Okay? When we look at the context, because what do we care about is the context. And if you don't have context, then you have a pretext. And if you have a pretext, then you're creating something very, very beginning. And it's a, it's a new thing. So the moment that somebody takes out verse 14 and makes it a pretext, then you should automatically, bells should be going off in your head thinking, I may not need to listen to this person. But I want you to notice something real quick. Look at, uh, look at chapter 6, verse 1. He says, We then as workers together with Him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. What are we? Workers together with Him. Verse 3, giving no offense in anything that the, what? Ministry be not blamed. Look in verse 4, but in all things approving ourselves as the, what? Ministers of God. What do you think that he's talking about in the context here is what? We as fellow workers with God as ministers, the ministry that we have as believers. That's the ministry that he's talking about. That's what he's talking about in the context. So you get down to verse 14. Notice what he says. <clears throat> Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now that's not talking about marriage because the context is talking about what? Your ministry. And I'm not talking about what we're doing here. Of course, what we're doing here is a ministry, but each and every one of us has our own ministry wherever we live, wherever we work, right? Right? It says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols, for ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and, know, and what? Be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Do you know what he's saying? <clears throat> in your heart that you're not going to defile yourself because of who you are in Christ. You're going to separate yourself. Like I said, the doctrine that we teach separates us to be, to, right off the bat. <clears throat> but what he's saying here is he's taking a look at the ministry and saying, don't allow all this other junk out there. That system that's already in place, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Paul says over in 2 Thessalonians, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. What takes place is there's things out there that are being taught that we should avoid. Your decision. And there are some things out there that we should pay attention to. Again, your decision. When somebody teaches something, you're like, I don't know about that. I'd probably put them down here. Try and get in touch with them, see if they have something that they might want to say. And you go from there. Um, go get Isaiah chapter 52. We see, the, we see the same kind of thing here. Um, Isaiah 52, um, start off in verse 9. He says, um, Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted His people and hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare His holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Notice in verse 11. Depart ye, depart ye. Go ye out from thence, touch, not un, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. 
For ye shall not go out with the ha- with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the Lord, uh, Lord, or the God of Israel will be your re- reward. I'll double check that, and make sure I said that right. So what's he say? All these other things out here, depart from it. Depart ye, depart ye. You know, anytime, anytime Scripture says something twice, we might want to pay attention. One last verse. <clears throat> Uh, Revelation chapter 17. Um, and like I said, there's there's different types of separation. We'll talk about that. But I want you to see how that works to begin with. And then we'll, we'll look at how, how that separation actually works. Because like I said, people talk about, hey, let's separate. But then they never talk about the how. Um, sometimes they don't even talk about the why. <clears throat> so here's what's going to take place. Revelation chapter 17, start off in verse 1. There's some things that will take place in the future. And what happens is, people who don't take this doctrine of separation seriously, they're going to fall for exactly what we're getting ready to talk about here. Chapter 17, verse 1. And there came... One of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will shew unto thee the the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. If you you, um, look down at verse 15, you'll see what that means, upon many waters. Notice in verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. So when he talks about the, the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, he's talking about people. Okay, And so then you you get that, that going on there. But notice in verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in, in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones, and pearls having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. You think about what's going on there. That's the religious system that's going to overtake the world at some point. And if people... Like I said, if people don't take this doctrine seriously now, what are they going to do? They're going to fall for that. And the fact that you've got pastors in pulpits this morning, like the Joel Osteens, they are preparing people for that kingdom, or for that, for that uh, mystery battle on the great. They're preparing them for spiritual fornication. That's a scary thing to think about. So from, from Genesis all the way through Revelation, we've got this Baal worship that's been put out there. And, and you know, we talked about this before. When, when Paul talks about in the last days people are going to depart from the faith and all that stuff, we talked about the fact uh, where he says, um, they're going to, uh, just as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. We've talked about that before. How did Janus and Jambres withstand Moses? Well, <clears throat> Moses throws his staff down turns into a snake. What did Janus and Jambres do? Threw their staff down and it, they, they turned into snakes. Well, what did Moses' the snake do? Ate theirs up, right? But what did they do? They said, we're doing the same thing that Moses is. We're just like him. All right? So then, then when he turns water into, into blood, what do they do? 
turn water into blood. And they say, see, we're just like him. We're, we're the same God as, as him. We're all the same. There's no difference between us. So let's just go about our merry way and, and, and join together and kumbaya and all that stuff. Be careful when people say, let's compromise. Like yeah. Because that's, I mean, you know, years ago I would have thought um, that Catholic might be the head of bell worship. Um, but the more I think about it, um, I see Islam would be. Because, I mean, Islam has what? They do have a connection back to Abraham. and they can, li they can literally and legitimately say that they have Abraham as their father. And then, you know, like I, uh, I mentioned this Friday night, you've got people over there in the Middle East fighting over property, over land, that they both claim they have right to. And then everybody else says, well, let's just try and make peace and we'll split the land and all that stuff. They don't really know the real reason of why they're fighting. And they're trying to go in and fix it, and they can't fix it because it's a spiritual thing that they can't, they, they don't understand. Um, but I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff over there that, that's taking place. But as soon as somebody says, let's compromise, that's when you're done. Again, your choice. Um, but that's, you know, as far as, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's where I kind of draw the line. And um, <clears throat> there was something... Something else I was wanting to mention, but I can't see it in my notes. Oh, there it is. <clears throat> this was something that I wrote down. Um, <clears throat> uh, from Brother Jordan. <clears throat> One of the things that, that Paul does um, over in, 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 in Romans chapter 16 that, that we need to make sure that we get this, this doctrine separation and the warning he says, now I beseech you, brethren. He's begging them to look at this and see people that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. He said, I have given you all this information. I have laid the foundation for you, which is all the previous chapters. Now I want to tell you, I want you to be motivated on the basis of grace to do something. And he warns them. He says, Christian love is not a, a saccharine sweetness of sob sisters. I like that line. A saccharine of sweetness of sob sisters. It's not a bunch of soft, compromised sellouts. Christian love is dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ and the standards and the values that He sets. And so one of the toughest things that we can do is by grace do exactly what, what Paul is telling us to do is to separate ourselves from people. And honestly, what that's going to do is... One, because of what we teach, we're not going to fill up this room ever, probably. Just because of what we teach. Um, but then you sit and think, why do people not want to hear this? It sets you free from everything that you could ever imagine. Honestly, I'm a, I think people are more afraid of freedom and that's one reason why. Responsibility. That's what it is. With freedom comes responsibility. And in order to actually understand how grace works, I mean, in order to understand how that freedom works, you have to understand how grace works. And you can't say, well, Pastor Santo told me to do this. Yeah. Because if it's some thing that I can do, I can say I've done it. Right? Well, when it's your own personal decision, whether or not you've trusted Christ, and it's not some ceremony that proves that you've accepted Him. But I mean, the, when, we, when we think about what's going on here, and like I said, we're going to look at, the, at um, four different types of separation. Uh, we'll take a look at that last uh, next week. 
But I want you to see the, the pattern which Daniel shows us. Here's how we separate ourselves. It's a heart decision that we make in our, make in our heart that we won't defile who we are in Christ. And it's, it's, it's by the ba- be motivated by the basis of grace to do exactly what God has us to do. Um, to me, it's exciting. You know, there's, there's, everybody always wants to talk about narrow is the gate. And every one of them is over on this big wide road trying to go through the wide gate. But they're talking about this narrow gate. And I'm just... <clears throat> All right, so we'll finish up there. Um, any questions, comments, concerns? And like I said, this is stuff I just lay at your doorstep and you all decide. That's the, that's the funnest thing. I don't think it's a word. But the most fun part about it is I don't have to call you out on stuff. I mean, that's it. it's you. It's Christ living and working in you. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so we'll pick back up on this next time. Take a look at, at what it means. Um, don't forget, John the Baptist was by himself out in the wilderness. Just him, and his yeah. And he made it through all right. Well, until he was beheaded, but that's yeah, that's a different story. <laughs> It's true. <clears throat> all right. Uh, so we'll pick up there next time. And uh, thank you all for joining us online and everybody showing up here. And we'll see you Wednesday night, I guess, then online. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we had to study your word. Uh, as we always pray, our, our, our prayer is that we always allow your word to be the final authority in all things. Um, not what we think it means, not what we think it says, but the actual words on the page allow them to be the issue um, in all manner of life, that we might be able to live a life glorifying to you and your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in His name we pray. Amen.